All right, my brothers and sisters, let us um let us continue. Let's continue this particular reasoning, and um, we're in our Rasafari Sabbatical scroll, side scroll number forty, that's known as Balak. Balak. Now, to get a basic summary, a basic overview, so we're not going to go into much of the details. But who was Balak? Let us deal with names, and let's understand these names first. Now, Balak. He hires, he hires um, the lamb because he grew alarmed at the Beit Israel, at our military victories among the Amorites. He consulted with the elders of Median, and he sent elders of Moab and Median to a land by the Euphrates, the Euphrates River. That means to the east, all right, to the east, not the west, not the African direction but the but the east that's going to like Iran I mean Iraq more Iraq and like um, Syria Iraq that's Syria uh, Syria Phoenician Syria um, Arabian um, direction among the other peoples you understand and this this um this um, separation in a sense still exists even today, even on today's level, it's a little more even racially definable. You understand? And you all have been hearing about what's been going on in Syria. And, and we would like to say something on that, but it has already been said on that at this present time. Um, but that's just an interesting situation, I mean, to even see in a modern time such brutality. You know, and such levels of killing. See, there are certain things that give the Almighty the right, according to His righteous law. You know, and that, that, that in a sense robs nations of mercy. You know, and, and basically um, sets them on the termination and extermination level if and when there is a righteous nation. So we see that with the Beit Israel. Many look at the Bible and say, well, look at the victories of Joshua and, and, and what Joshua and the tribes did. Look how they were killing people, so forth and so on. One don't understand the backstory. You know, just like we wanted to do a lecture speaking about slavery, that slavery basically, on a certain level, is coming back. You know, but not in the way that most folks expect it. You understand? Know, because the, the word says that he who kills by the sword must be killed by the sword. And he who leads into what? Captivity must be led into captivity. The key thing for us, Mitmanan, faithful brothers and sisters and mothers, is, is the patience that we need. Remember, patience is the faith of the Kedusan. Kedusan means those who are holy ones. And Kedus means to be set apart. So, we have to make sure that we are separate. You understand? We're in the world, but we're not of the world. You understand? Overstand being separate on the spiritual value. Therefore, won't be separate on the psychological value. You understand? And then when the time is to separate on the flesh level, you understand? And to come out, you understand? In community, that way would have already been set. So, we're seeking to go over um, the proper order, you know, because as Jah opens up I and I overstanding, it becomes so beautiful, but then it's like, wow, we've been looking at it like this. How do you communicate this, you understand, to the people? And it's like Ezekiel in the Valley of the Dry Bones. He says to do what? He says to preach, to prophesy, 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 to prophesy to the people, to, to show them, the, the prophecy, see, prophecy is very, very important because that, that verifies the reality of it. You understand? Know that, that verifies what the truth is to it. You understand? I mean, true prophecy. But now, Balaam is another sort of prophet. So he went to the, the land by the Euphrates, and they invited, you know, they said like a devil can't come in unless you invite them in. So here they invite the prophet Belaam to come and curse the Beta Israel 
for him. Right? For him in Numbers chapter 22, verses 4 to 7. Now, Balaam, he told them to spend the night here, and I shall reply to you as the Lord may instruct me. Now, here's the curious thing is that Balaam seems to have had some sort of relationship with he a recognition of the Lord, of Yahweh, Yod Hey Wow Hey, of Jah or 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 the God of the Israelites. Not as the God of the Israelites, but still as the God. And this is interesting, there's a lot of people out there who say like um that that this is not real, what we speak of, so forth and so on. But as many of those at the highest so-called levels of this conspiracy against the King of Kings who even know that he is who he is, you know what I'm saying, and who I and I say that he is. So you, you think about that and you say, well, if, if he knows, if Balaam knows who Jah is, then, you know, why is he doing what he's doing? You know what I'm saying? And, and just remember this connection that we made with Balaam. And perhaps it is probably good to um, get into this detail about who is Bela'am. Now, here it's interesting because we're going to go to the, the um, what's known as the inner biblical, the inner biblical interpretation, the classic so-called rabbinical interpretation. Now, in classical um, rabbinic interpretation among the, the, the ravim or the rabbim or the rabbis of old, Bela'am was viewed in an unfavorable sense, not, not positively, in other words. Now, the Mishnah, it taught that Bela'am was one of four commoners, four commoners who have no portion in the world to come, that Bela'am has no portion in the world to come, in, in the new world. In other words, this old world, like there's many people who have become anti-Christ, you understand, and who have sold their souls, too. In this world, in this present world, is their only world. You understand, so now the fight is on to preserve this world, even though they see a new world, a new world order coming into being. Not what they're talking to you about. See, that's a, that's a shell game right there. They're trying to make you believe that, well, the new world, there will be a new world, and they got it on lock. That's not what the word says. That's not what the reality says. But... Balaam or Bela'am, he's one of four commoners who have no portion. He has no part in the world to come. Along with him is Doeg, um, Ahitophel, and Gehazi. Gehazi. So we have Bela'am, Doeg, Ahitophel, and Gehazi. They have no portion in the world to come according to the, the classic, that means like the ancient Rebim, and we're most likely speaking about the, the, the ethnic Hebrews, you know what I'm saying? Because a lot of the ancient wisdom that was ours, you know what I'm saying? When, when we went into captivity, slavery, dispersion in 70 AD, the other Jews and others came into that way after the Council of Jamina in and about 90 A.D., Council of Jamna, check it out. That's where modern Judaism comes in. Remember the Falasha, the Beta Israel, their Judaism, you understand, is at least 32 to 3,600 years old. Let us understand, Falasha Anthology, a very, very crucial and important book. Much we can learn from that. But anyway, following the teaching of... Um, of, of Rebbe uh, Yeshua, Joshua, the Gemara, it deduced from the Mishnah statement that the Gentile, that Bala'am was a Gentile, not a Hebrew, you understand, and definitely not a Beta Israeli or Beta Israelawi, he would not enter the world to come, that other Gentiles would, that some of the other Gentiles, and this is what we speak about the righteous Gentiles, the righteous Goyim, some of the righteous Goyim, they would enter the world to come. You understand, the true new world order of the King of Kings and his Christ. But ones like Bala'am, Doeg, Ahitophel, and Gehazi, they would not. Now the Gemara, it read Bala'am's name. I thought this was interesting right here on page 314 of um, the, the, the Midbar, the Hebrew book of, of, uh, of Numbers. 
it, it read Balaam's name to demonstrate that he was, quote, without a people. I thought that was a very interesting reading of a name, Balaam, from Belo, Belo, Belo Am, meaning without a people, Belo Am. See, here we're getting into the etymology, the Hebrew on a level, the Hebrew etymology, as we touch also on the Ethiopic etymology of the name. Now, in an alternative sense, the Gemara, it read Bela'am's name to demonstrate that he confused. What Bela'am did was confuse the people. Or on a certain level, you could say he dis diffused the people. See, if Tawahedo, if the Ritua Hymenot is Tawahedo, and that means oneness, that means a fusion, then he did the opposite to it. It's like the great apostasy that we see going on with the church and even amongst the Ethiopian Orthodox Church with, with all the whitewash, the images, the foreign Renaissance um, papal images that have replaced and uprooted and are confusing the people in the modern Ethiopian Orthodox Church in the present time. Not all the churches, but even in Ethiopia and from what we're seeing here and there, it's very shocking. But when we understand what Revelation says concerning Bela'am, the sin of Bela'am, and the doctrine or the teaching of Bela'am, it becomes very clear to us the prophetic and bigger picture. And y'all willing, we will be able to explain some of it, most of it, if not all of it, as we can to you to those who can receive it. So his name can mean also that he confused a people. Bila, Bila or Bila'am, 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 namely the Israelites. That his, what he did ultimately was confuse the Beit Israel, just like these prosperity pimps and preachers, these, these, these prophets for hire, you understand, or prophets for sale, just like they're doing with the lost sheep, the Negroes, blacks, and coloreds, artificial 13th and 14th Amendment persons, according to law. You know what I'm um, Sujurus, right? Noting the similarity of Bela'am's father's name, and who was his father? He was the son of Beor, to the Aramaic. The Aramaic word for beast is Be'ir, Be'ir. Be'ir or Be'ir, Be'ir, you understand, know means beast. So the Gemara, it read the allusion to Bela'am's father in Numbers chapter 22 and 5 to demonstrate that Bela'am committed bestiality. So now some of the scholars and those, you see, when you're studying it, when you get beyond, okay, the basic story, and you really now start to study the word, you start to see these subtle hints and links, right, that, that also help to further explain. Because you have to remember that what we have written in the Afro-Shemitic, the Ethiopic, and in the Hebrew is like the mystery of, of ancient Egypt and the mystery schools, right? It's like, the, it's like the mysteries, the ancient mythology in a sense, but not in a visual way, but in a word way. You know what I'm saying? So as one would interpret the... the the visual hieroglyphs, it's important to interpret the, the, the verbal hieroglyphs, just like the parables is another example of these verbal hieroglyphs. That's why it says that Christ, he gave the people who are outside, who are not discipled, in other words, he gave it to them in a symbolical language. But he explained this, and the mystery of it was given to his disciples. So to those of us who are disciple in spirit and in truth, you know what I'm saying? Jah also gives to us the Holy Spirit, shows us more things on a, on a certain level because we have come in. We are we are in and according to His His His, his covenant. You know what I'm saying? We're in agreement because we're of faith. It's, I like to use this example. Would you tell someone your secrets? Some people would not, but if you had to tell someone your secrets, you would tell it to someone who you could trust, but moreover, you would tell it to someone who trusts you. You see, someone who trusts you and that you can trust, 
You can entrust them with your secrets. That's what the mysteries are, the mishtir. You know, that's what even the true interpretation of the ancient mythology is a part of a, it's a mystery there. They say the mystery of God in Christ. And it's also a mystery of iniquity too. There are mysteries that you have to be in the trust of the true God, the faith of the true God, to be able to, to, to see this and to receive it. That's why Christ over and over said, whoever is able to receive it. You know, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith. What the Spirit saith, that means you have to hear that with not your fleshy ears, but with your spiritual ears. So you have to get your house, in other words, your spiritual house, your head and your heart, in order. You understand? And the, and the beginning initiation is that repentance. You understand? Is that recognition, that repentance, and that being born again, and that study and growing up, and then fellowship also adds to that. You understand? But you need to be able to um, test the spirit. You know, test the spirit. I'm when it says try every spirit to see whether they are of God. So your senses should be, um, by reason of exercise, able to discern good and evil, not from how it seems to you on the outside, you understand, but from the spiritual, you understand, and based on his word. You, you always, because someone who, who, who is in spirit and in truth, and if you're in spirit and in truth, you might not agree on everything, but at least you'll, you'll have a, 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 a common wealth, a common context, a common reference point. So there is a matter of iron sharpening iron, all right? So you really, we have to know who our brothers and sisters are. We can teach. We can help people out in the world. We can help others who are not of I and I number, but we are not friends with them. You understand? We are not fellows with them. We do not fellowship with them. You think they're not our brothers, but we can help them. We, it is good to do good, but you have to know, well, who is your family? And to know who is your family, well, who is your father? You understand? Who is your mother? You understand? How do you relate? What is the relationship here? And what is that relationship based on? What's the foundation of that relationship? If it's not on Yeshua HaMoshia in spirit and in truth, then it's like building your house on sand. And only a fool will do that. So if you lack wisdom, wisdom, then pray to the Father. Don't be wavering. Don't be double-minded. James, read James. James Epistle will give you many, many clues and, and helpful pointers there. So they read also that, that Balaam's father, right, in, in his name, to demonstrate that Balaam or his father may have committed bestiality. Now, there's a tana, which is like a, a study, right? And uh, there's a tana that taught that Beor was the same person as one named Kushan Rishatayim, uh, Rishatayim, and Laban. Now, Rishatayim, and I touched on that before, I call that the evil, the evil Ethiopian. Not the Ethiopians all, but a particular ancient Ethiopian. You have to remember that that whole region over there, as far as as Syria, you understand, and, and Babylon was ruled by the ancient Ethiopians. The whole link with Nimrod or Namrud should be very, very clear. You understand? Um, even the archaeology where you see the black um, Assyrians, the black Assyrians, those were... Um, sub-Ethiopian or related Ethiopian peoples like Hindus Kush and in India from ancient times. You know, was, so it's not just because they're Ethiopian or they're related to Ethiopian that makes them good. Just like it's not because they're Ethiopian or Medianite or Moabite that makes them evil. You know, it's what spirit and what fruit, what deed they do. Now, Kushan Rishtayim, Rishtayim, it means two evils. Two evils. Now, the Tana, it deduced that the name Kushan or Rishtatayim, that Beor perpetrated two evils, that he perpetrated two evils on Israel. What are these two evils? One was in pursuing Ya'ikov, as we have in Genesis chapter 31, verse 
23 to 29, and the other was by downpressing the the Beta Israel or the Hebrews, the the Judeans in Judges chapter 3 verse 8. Now noting that Numbers 22 and 5 calls Belaam the son of Beor, while in Numbers chapter 24 and 3 it says something a little bit different that Belaam his son his son was Beor. Now one particular Rebbe, one named Johannes, he deduced that Belaam's father Beor was like his son. That in other words, Belaam's father, the one before him, was like his son. In other words, interpreted from the name Beir, beast, less able, less able in matters of prophecy. So Belaam had a particular gift of prophecy, you know, that his father didn't have and that his son didn't have. Now, the, 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 like I said, the article um, from Revelation27.org, I think is XI or Chapter 11, The Nature and the Name of the Beast. It's very interesting, and, and even now I could more understand why there was that connection how did he come to the connection, that particular um, 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 Jewish Gentile brethren, how did he come to that connection between Belaam and the whole mark of the beast? It's in the name son of Beor, or Be'ir, Be'ir, Be'ir in the Aramaic, which means beast. So when we see that he was the son, he was the son of Beor, and that he had a son named Beor, and this particular Torah portion is very interesting. Because remember, he's being hired by Balak, and, and, and we need to better understand, well, who is Balak? Like we mentioned, there's some very interesting notes down here in our Schofield Study um, Bible. You should already have references if you have a copy. If not, we'll try to go over these notes right here, um, but we want to touch a little bit on some of these names right here, Balak, since this Torah portion is Balak, it will be good to go into, well, who was Balak, and what does Balak, what would Balak now prophetically, in that sense, mean to I and I? You understand? What does Balak, in that sense, mean to I and I, in what way is it referential to us, especially in the Moshia and through the Moshia? How does it how does it reference to anything with us? Now, without the knowledge of the name, see a lot of folks that be reading the Bible, but without the knowledge of the name, what is the name? Even when Moses was being sent to the Beit Israel, he said, um, but what is, the people will want to know what is your name? You understand? So it wasn't good enough to say the God of the Hebrews, what is the name? Um, uh, Proverbs, I think chapter 30 also, 30, 31, also says the same thing, um, where it says, what is his name and what is his son's name? You understand? So knowledge of the name is very, very important. So here, let's go to Balak for a moment. Although, um, in this particular study, a better beginning well, maybe for Balaam, we'll deal with Baal. Baal is very important, but Baal comes into the story a little bit later on. First things first, let's deal with, um, let's deal with Balak. Balak. Because here in chapter 22, there's the march of Beta Israel. Balaam, it has some New Testament references, Second Peter 2.15, Jude 11, Revelation 2.14. So when you see these references, like in the study Bible, read through the portion. Like read through that particular portion, say, until you get to a next um, subscription. And after you read through there, then go to the New Testament. Then go and study the New Testament portion. You know, don't run from there. Just read, the, read that portion there. But then after you read that particular portion or section, you know, but between there and the next subscription, then go and study and reference the New Testament um, 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 references that are given, the New Testament verses that are given, because 
um, when you do that, you begin to, that veil will begin to lift off of one's eye, and one can see the, the fullness in and through the Moshiach. Not just studying the Old Testament in the way that the foolish Jews do. And when we say foolish, we're talking about from our Ethiopic perspective. Our people, you understand, the, the Hebrews who rejected, you understand, Yeshua, are like the Ethiopian and black folks who reject Kedemawi Haile Shalasik and go after the Gentiles. It's, it's, the same sort of, it's the same sort of paradigm right there. But some can't see it just yet, and, and I pray that they will be able to see it. But here, Balak, right, Balak, his name is said from Hebrew to mean emptier, emptier, waster, spoiler, devastator, destroyer. Now, he was a king of Moab who was frightened because of Israel's victories. He fought against Israel and tried to hire Balaam to curse the men, to curse the men of Israel, that he might defeat them. Now that's an important note right there. Most say he wanted to curse the Israelites. Yes, he wanted to curse the Israelites, but when he said the Israelites, he wanted to curse the Israelite men. You know what I'm saying? Like those who want to curse the black man. Balak is like the one who want to curse the black man, or they, those who want to curse the Ethiopian Hebrew man, those who want to curse the Rastafari man. So we can look at this both in, in the prophetic sense with us over here in the Americas, right, in the Caribbean, as well as in the African sense vis-a-vis -vis those who wore those red fez, those red fez caps, Moorish, Moroccan, Ashkari, whatever, vis-a-vis -vis Ethiopia, and in particular with the fascist invasion of Ethiopia. So that's a very interesting kind of connection there to go into. Um, so the key is that he wanted to curse the men. He wanted to weaken the men, to destroy the men. It's like the war on the black male. It's like COINTELPRO. It's like Willie Lynchism. It's, it's like the very same thing. So Balak Right? What does Balak um, represent in this sense? He, he's a king. He was frightened because Israel was gaining victories. It's like when the black man, even in America, started, and whenever he starts to rise, there's a certain consciousness, a lower consciousness, an evil consciousness. And, and sometimes it's even among people who we would not expect, we would think that they would be happy that we rise. You understand? But as we're learning more of who we are, we become dangerous to others out there because what they are holding and claiming to be their own really belongs to us. You understand? So to short-circuit that, they attack us or they seek to curse us like Balak did to the men of Israel so he might defeat. So it's an interesting idea, isn't it? That even though Balak, he has troops, he has soldiers, he can get up his, his, his posses and everything, and he can fight like a man, but he sees the base Israel are victorious. So he's now trying to enlist as part of his, 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 his art of warfare. He's trying to enlist um, witchcraft, we can say. You understand? Or spirit craft. You understand? Or perhaps you call it today psyops on some level against the men of Israel, the black men of Israel. Now, metaphysically, Balak means this. On the spiritual interpretation, a empty, void, destructive, wasting thought. Empty or devastator, waster, spoiler, destroyer, destroyer, that rules the carnal mind. That rules the carnal mind. And then it has Moab. We're going to do something that we um, didn't intend to, but the Spirit said it will be very important to go here. Let's go to um, Moab. Let's look up Moab, since he's king of Moab. Now, who is Moab? Do you know the story of Moab? Are you familiar with it? So, brothers and sisters who seek the discipleship deraja, 
you need to do this study. So if someone were to ask you, if you were to ask yourself, you know what I'm saying, who is Moab? That you will know these things, that it will be very easy to put these things together. You know what I'm saying? You should not just know the name, but, okay, what does the name mean? What is the meaning of the name? Moab, in its simplest sense, means from the Father or of the Father, the seed of the Father, the water of the water, flowing from the Father, what of the Father. So Moab could also be in Old Hebrew like Moab, like what of the Father, of his Father. Now, that was the son of Lot by his eldest daughter. That's the, so, so they're the children in the sense of, of incest, we can say. The son of Lot by his eldest daughter, from him the Moabites were descended. Let's look at the, the metaphysical of this for a moment. Because if we don't understand the Moabites, then how can we understand the king of Moab? Since we already went across his name, his name basically means wasteful, emptiness, Basically, his name means the big fat zero. Balak was a big fat zero, right? He was the king of the Moabites, right, of Moab. So we have to find out, well, who was Moab? And why was the Moabites so afraid? Now, the Moabites are going to come up in this portion a little bit later on. They finally did hatch a scheme to um, curse on a level or to defeat the black men of Israel. And that reminded me a lot of Woolly Lynchism. In fact, I wanted to do part of this um, lecture um, calling it um, Black Bolam and, and COINTELPRO on a certain level because the same thing. You know what I'm saying? That when, when Israel was gaining victories, when, when the black man, even in America, was gaining victory, even in Africa, during the time, the dispensation, the visitation of Ketamawi, Hala Selassie, when they were gaining victories, people got afraid. These so-called world rulers and others got afraid. You understand? Just like the ones who fought against the blameless Ethiopians on the side of fascist Italy. They were black people. You see it in the historical pictures. They're wearing these little fezzes on their head, these little red caps. Right, the the Phrygian cap of liberty, you know, and that's related to the whole Moabites, and then we also have the Moorish. Now, the Moorish in America can be somewhat exempted from the Moors on the continent, but as they link with the Moors on the continent, you understand, know, and don't clear themselves, you know, saying they become like Balak. You understand? Know, they have to clear themselves. You know what I'm saying? Otherwise, they're like Balak. That's what it says. A Moabite cannot enter into the congregation. Now, many Moabites will cite Ruth, right? Will cite Ruth as a particular example. But the law, in that sense, still stands that the Moabites, what are the Moabites? Moabites are descendants of Moab, son of Lot, in Genesis 19.37. But metaphysically, Moabites, who are they? What are they? They are thoughts. Moabites, now this is on the spiritual level. This is like more of the Kabbalah level. But this is really the New Testament real level, right? That when we look at Moabites, we recognize, okay, they were descendants of Moab, the son of Lot, Genesis 19, verse 37. Okay, I got that historical, biblical. But now on the spiritual level, or the New Testament, the Hadith Kidan level, Moabites, the Rastafari, right knowledge, now teaches us that the Moabites represent thoughts springing from and belonging to that in consciousness which Moab signifies. So what is it in consciousness? That means that we might not be physical flesh and blood Moabites, but we might have Moabites in our consciousness, in our mind state. So what are Moabites? Because a Moabite cannot enter into, you know what I'm saying, the congregation of the Lord, right? And we saw the male Moabite. So that, that's also very, also important on the metaphysical spiritual level right there. But let's get into Moab. Moab seems to have two sides to its significance. Moab has two sides, so it's like double-sided. It's like ambidextrous. You understand? There's a, there's a, um, 
a duality, right, to the significance of Moab. Moab means the seed of the father, the seed, the sperm, in other words, of the father flowing from the father, of his father. And while Moab represents the body, Moab represents the body, to say the carnal, and the most external conditions of life. So it's the body, it's the outer. There is something good in it, or at least a possibility of good. You see, so there's a possibility of good. From the top of a mountain in Moab, quote, Mount Nebo, at the top of Pisgah, Yahweh showed Moses, Mashu, Muse, the promised land in Deuteronomy chapter 34 and 1. He could not enter in because of, we know what happened in the previous Torah portion. You understand? Yet, he was taken to this mountaintop in Moab and he was showed the promised land. So he's seen the promised land. Now, Ruth, or Cherut, Cherut, whose name basically means the goodness or the chosen or the chosen goodness, Ethiopically, Cherut or Herut, she represents the love of the natural, the natural soul for God. So the natural soul, unadulterated, not contaminated by artificiality sort of a soul, you understand, has a natural love for God. And from her, she's the one from whom David, David, and Yeshua, Jesus, Jesus, were descendant. She was a Moabitess. Now, this is also very important for, for, for the sisters, you sisters or the brothers, who might be viewing this, if your sisters are also like-minded in their studies and in growing in the knowledge of the Word, this is very important. The example of Chirut, or Ruth, in the sisterhood. Hopefully we'll have an opportunity to go into that in some of the sisterhood um, lectures and, and teaching the Shireen. But on the other hand, so she's the positive aspect. That's, that's the aspect where there's something good in Moab and among the Moabites, you understand? As we see, there's something, possibility of good, you understand, among the Moorish on a certain level of getting us acquainted, you understand, with the law, you understand, and the operation of law. And, and, and their diligence on those aspects is a, a, a great um, encouragement to I and I. You understand? However, we are not Moabites. We are Israelitish. You understand? Nationality-wise, we are Ethiopian. We are Ethiopian Hebrews. You understand? We are landless people. You understand? At the present time, just like the Beta Israel, our ancestors were. But on the other hand, the text, quote, Cursed be he that doeth the work of Yahweh negligently, and cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. Jeremiah chapter 48 and 10. This accompanies a charge from Adonai to destroy Moab. So this word right here that we have in Jeremiah 48 and 10, it goes along with a charge, a is, a is, or like to say, t-is-a-z, or is, a charge, a command on that level, like a military command that came from Adonai to destroy, to downstroy Moab in the prophet Jeremiah's um, tindit or his prophecy. Now, Moab here, in this context, in Jeremiah 48 and 10, Moab here, it signifies carnal mind. And we've been teaching and lecturing on this. 
It signifies the fleshy or the worldly, quote, end quote, mind. The worldly mind. Lust born. We have lust born. Turpit, turpitude. When the individual enters, when any of us as an indivisible dual, an individual enters into the overcoming life, into the true life, being born again, you understand that, that whole born again aspect, entering into the overcoming life, he receives, each of us receives. So when we are newborn and truly are newborn, you understand that we have entered into that overcoming life in spirit and in truth. We receive in us that very same is, that very same command, that very same commission, co-mission, that co-mission to destroy, to cast out the carnal mind or, quote, personal and limited self. You see, and a lot of us, we might do the outer things. But in the study of the Word and the real growth in the Word and through the Word and Spirit and the truth, you begin to recognize that, that you have to recognize yourself. It's not reading this and looking at the other guy and saying, yeah, man, this is about you. It might be. But the first thing, you have to clear yourself. You know what I'm saying? You have to be clear. You know what I'm saying? Are you clear? Are you clear? Yeah, I'm clear. Are you sure? Yes, I'm clear. You know what I'm saying? You have to clear yourself. So when we enter into the true life, the true new birth. And this is one of the basic things that has, ha has, has happened. You understand? When we enter in. But what happens is that many of us, we misinterpret it. We misinterpret because we're not studying the Word. I, I heard a, 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 a teacher of the Word one time teach that, you know what happens to most folks when the Holy Spirit really speaks to them. When the Holy Spirit speaks to folks who are, in a sense, unbiblical, unbibled, they don't have a basis, a foundation, they think it's a devil. They think it's a devil that's talking to them. Because in their heart, there's a foolishness. Because a fool says in his heart, there's no God. There is not the word of Jah in their consciousness. So they're not really understanding that command or that commission. They haven't received it to destroy and cast out the carnal life. What many do ignorantly is build on the carnal life and then try to pass off the carnal life as so-called spirituality. You understand? And that is a fraud to, to self and to your fellow man. That's a fraud to God and to man. So we receive, we must receive that commission to downstroy, to destroy, to cast out. What? What are we downstroying? What are we casting out? We're casting out the carnal mind. This is why in the Rastafari chant, we say, I, and I, and I want no carnal mind. We're chanting, we don't want no carnal mind. Well, we, th that's good to say we don't want it, but we have to do the active work of faith, you know what I'm saying, in casting it out. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 and recognizing and headresting and praying, you know what I'm saying, and, and watching our words, what we say. You understand? You know, be, being more conscious. You understand? And when we make those errors, seek forgiveness and correct those things. You understand? Within ourself. In other words, take that beam, in other words, out of our own eyes so we truly can be a brother or a sister for I and I, brothers and sisters. Now, this is the self. This is the, the ras. Ras. Bamarinya in them heart refers to self. There's a word for self, ras. It's a word for head, but also in, in, in the context and in the language, it is used for self. So this is the self, or this is the ras, to which Yeshua, to which Jesus referred when he said, quote, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself. If any of us truly are sons and daughters of his majesty in and through our black Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we must hear that word, and we must act on that word. If any man would come after me, if we are truly followers and disciples as his majesty teaches, we have to deny ourselves. We have to deny our ego, our ego, our ego, right? 
when man takes up this work, John's work, he must not be deceitful. When we take up John's work, we cannot be deceitful about this particular work. We can't be deceitful about it. You understand? We can't be deceitful about it by keeping back part of the price. You see the price? Profit, sale, profit, hire, Balan. You see the connection? Hired by Balak, king of Moab. And we're now digging into who is Moab. What is Moab all about? We must not be deceitful about it by keeping back part of the price. As Ananias and Sapphira did in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, or by seeking or by or by seeking to save some of the carnal self when it says no carnal mind it means exactly that no carnal mind you can't seek to save some of the carnal self the goodliest the goodliest of it as a con a con did see and read Joshua chapter 7 Joshua chapter 7, it gives us that story of Akon or Akon. I like to call it Akon man. You know what I'm saying? How he kept some of the goodliest Babylonian garments, though they were told to take nothing, that it is harem. You understand? It is harem. All of this is forbidden. You understand? The, the first, those spoils were for the, the, the Levites, were for the tabernacle, so it was forbidden to the Israelites. In other engagements... We could take up the spoil of those who we defeated in military, in military conflict. You understand? In military combat. In, 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 in Krav Waga. Krav Maga. You understand? However, in this particular situation here, it was forbidden in Joshua chapter 7. You understand? So what is that an example of? It's an example of this very same thing, and we're still in, in, in alignment with Jeremiah the prophet. Cursed be he that doeth the work of Yahweh negligently, and cursed be he that keepeth back his sword, his sword from blood. Now, one might interpret this just on the outer sense, but remember, make sure you are balancing it with the inner sense. You understand? Or you might get to outer sense, you understand, or, you know, nonsense, in other words. For if he does these things, he will be cursed. For if one does these things, he will be cursed. Remember, Balak was hiring Balaam to curse the black man of Israel. Sounds like COINTELPRO. Sounds like the creeping coup in Ethiopia against his majesty. Sounds like the same old expletive, deleted, deleted. For if he does these things, he will be cursed. That is, he will not attain the happiness and the peace that come only to the wholehearted and true. See, it's only when we get to the being holistically and wholehearted and holy hearted and holy conscious, you understand, and the caduce, caduce in our sense, and true, in spirit and in truth, can we have that happiness and peace, you know? And because people are not going the right way, they go the wrong way. They get caught up on pharmaceutical drugs, or they wind up getting, you know, meds prescribed to them because they have a double-mindedness. You know what I'm saying? That means that they probably had an opportunity and still do have that opportunity, but it's spiritual forces that try to prevent them. They need to overstand to call upon the name of Adonai, to call upon the name of the Lord in spirit and in truth and in faith. You know, and not their faith, but to have faith on he who is faithful, our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua, HaMoshiach, for, for that help to overcome that. Because sometimes you can get so deep in a ditch that you might have been able to climb out of it before, but you've gotten so deep that you need help and Yeshua is there in spirit and in truth to help I and I and to help I and I brothers and sisters who have who have fallen short. You understand? And and who even presently are going through all sorts of crisis, you understand, in the world because 
they might might have knowledge, you understand, but they have not submitted. You understand it's that love and it's that submission. You understand you might know it, but you might not act act on that knowledge. You understand instead you are there's that war again in Acts of the Apostle chapter eight. There's that war again between the spiritual and the carnal. So check that out as well. Those who um are having you know having this wrestling and 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 if you're having a real a real jaw experience, you understand that wrestling between what you know in your spirit and your mind is true, and then the fleshy, and then the body, then the desires which are not true. There's that spiritual conflict. You know, so it's not something strange. It's just that one's education, experience, and environment may have ill prepared them for what they are experiencing. But all praise be to the King of Kings and His Christ for for his word and for this example of the true faith in his majesty and among the faithful and true. Nor may he be negligent in his work. What is the work that, that ones are negligent in? You know, unless you've read this before, you might not even, um, you, you know, you, you might interpret the word differently, but here, and this is accordance with the scripture, it says that, he, nor may he be negligent in his work of dying to the carnal mind or in mortifying, putting to death that carnal mind spiritually. You know, some get confused about the, the pluck your eye thing. You know, some have interpreted on the physical, the exoteric, not the esoteric sense. The esoteric sense is that we cannot be negligent or niggardly in our work of dying to the carnal mind. And you can see this happen among Rastafari, in the sense that the very same thing that we want to touch on was this sin, was this sin of Balaam. You understand? The, the doctrine of Balaam and what happened vis-a-vis -vis Balaam. He tried to curse the Israelites. You understand? Well, he was hired to curse the Israelites, and he found out he couldn't. And then he gave some advice. So instead of being able to curse the Israelites, you know what I'm saying? He had to bless the Israelites. But then the Israelites, in a sense, cursed themselves. And when I look at Baal Peor, and I look at what's going on with modern so-called black America, you, you know, I mean, it, it's like it's one and the same. And, and all these preachers and pastors for hire, they are not teaching. They have gone in the doctrine in the sense of Balaam. They, they have gone, and, and, and it gives you a beautiful understanding of what Revelation is seeking to communicate to us. But let's, let's get to uh, Balak and Moab, you know what I'm saying? And Moab, the carnal mind. So Moab refers to the carnal, the carnal mind, right? It says, nor may he be negligent in his work of dying to the carnal mind. For the lazy and slothful man, the spiritually lazy and slothful, we cannot be, it says, remember to keep the Shabbat holy. You know what I'm saying? Remember to keep the Shabbat. You know what I'm saying? We have to remember. Forgetfulness is a, is a form of spiritual laziness about what we should remember. If we say, well, we love job, then how can we forget these things? It's like forgetting job because these things are things of job. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and they're the things closest to us, you know what I'm saying, then that, that super spiritual reality, and we forget that, we're forgetting our link with the Holy and with the Holy One. So the lazy and slothful man will not win the prize that is set before him. And what is this prize that is set before I and I and I? It is eternal life and the preservation, the preservation of, of the entire man. What is the entire man? The entire man is a tripartite man. Is spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body. That's how we were created in the image and after the likeness of the triune God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, right? The true God of Israel. So there's a prize that is set before us. And if we are lazy about it, if we are slothful, like the psalm that says, the fool has said in his 
heart, there is no God because he does not store up. He does not preserve. You understand? He has nonsense. He remembers nonsense from the word from the world, but he don't remember the word of Jah. He doesn't store it up. It's not valuable. You understand to him. Yovas, that's being lazy. That's being slothful. And the ones, you know, it's not like ones run around saying, saying, I don't have no God, but the, the, the fool have said in his heart. So it's really the fool's heart or consciousness that is empty because he has been lazy or she has been lazy not to study, you understand, and show themselves approved, not to study and to grow. You understand, know because see, the study of it should be held. And when we study, we have to study in discipline because sometimes one study all sort of things. And, you know, can't make heads or hair out of it. No, one has, and this is why the Torah portion, reading and feedings are very, 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 very important for us because we already see within ourselves can testify. It has brought together a lot of what we had studied here and there over the years into, into harmony, orderly, and in a decent way. You understand where it has structure. You understand where, where it's meaningful, where it can be acted upon where it can be shareable and disseminatable with others, you understand, who also are testifying and giving I and I some wonderful testimony about Jah's word, how Jah's word is, is true, how it's touching them, you understand, and, and how they're more happy and peaceful, even and especially in a world like this. You understand, that is a spiritual gift to still maintain I and I joy, and maintain the true expectation of the King of Kings and his Christ and not getting caught up, you understand, on the make-believe, you understand, of the evildoers and the deception, you understand, because we know about it, we learn about it, we get wise to salvation. Now, the sword, interestingly enough, in this particular text, Jeremiah chapter 48 and 10, what does the sword represent? The sword represents, you know it, brothers and sisters, the sword represents the word of God. The sword represents, so now let's look at this again. It says, curse be he that doeth the work of Jah, the work of Jehovah, the work of Yahweh, negligently. And curse be he that keepeth back his sword from blood, that keepeth back his Word of God, his speaking the word of God, you understand, from blood. Now, what does blood mean? Blood is a symbol for life. When it says that we don't eat the blood, that's not kosher, you understand, we don't eat the blood, you understand, even when we ate debtors or as meat eaters in the old covenant, you understand, we did not eat the blood because the blood is the life, you understand, the life. So, the word of God and the life that keeps back the word of God from one's life. You see, a lot of folks will interpret in the Old Testament sense, you know, where it, it seems the outer is true. And there are contexts where it is. But see, when, when the outer level of this, as you see, where it says, um, keep back his sword from blood, from actually using a sword, you know, to, to cause blood, that means that, one, the spiritual heavens have fallen, the psychological, the soul heavens have fallen, and now we are now at that third, that, that's where a third fell from heaven, in other words. You understand? Know when we keep it on the spiritual, when we recognize the spiritual warfare, you understand? Know in the true faith, we avoid or minimize as much of that chaos as possible because we gain the victory spiritually. That does not mean that in a literal sense that never has to be so, but it means for us in the Moshiach, we are looking at this word and saying, well, how does this testify of you, Yeshua? How does this testify of our black Lord and Savior? How is this, he says, you can read the, you know, read the Old Testament, read the prophets, because you think you have life. But these are they which testify of me. So we have to see how this testifies, how all of this testifies to our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach. So what we did in this portion right here, 
and this is only, I would say, what, part one, part two, is basically make the link with um, Balak, right, Balak. Let's call this Balak here so we can keep track, and Moab. We went through, well, what, does, what do, does this name mean? We still need to do a little more on Belaam here. We just gave you a kind of an overview, an overview of Belaam right here. So, brothers and sisters, stay tuned. More is to come. Yah willing. Shalom. Rastafari.